His goodness. I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path He leadeth, but one step I may see. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. Hello. Welcome to our Bible study. My name is Clint McElroy. Today we'll be studying out of 2 Samuel chapter 17. The materials we cover today may be of an adult nature, so please be advised before showing this to children. We will be meeting today at 10 a.m., so please join us if you can. Masks will be available at the door for anyone who'd care to have one. If you're sick in any way, please don't come to the auditorium, but instead stay home and enjoy the streaming service. We'll also be meeting at 9 a.m. for classes, so please come and join us for those. You're welcome to join us in the auditorium to watch this class on the large screen there. We want to make sure everyone knows we have these English Standard Version Bibles from the World Bible School available for anyone who would care to have one. If you'd like to have one, please contact our church office and we'll make arrangements to get you one. Our sick list is quite long, so please refer to our bulletin for more information. Our sympathies are extended to the family of Doug Gideon at his passing, and our sympathies are also extended to the family of Ron Spellman at his passing. We want to remember in our prayers Sherry Crotcha, Emma Richardson, Betty Hart, Joy McElroy, B.J. Coker, Charles and Karen Brazil, Kent Gauntley, Jeanette and Ron Enman, Don Jones, Marianne Kinsey, Donnie Glenn Dixon, and David Garza. As is our custom, we want to remember the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus who were joined by a third man on the way. When they got to their destination, Jesus revealed himself to have been that third man, then he departed their company. They remembered in his absence that there had been a burning in their hearts while he was with them. It's that burning that they had in their hearts that we hope to kindle in our own hearts as we draw closer to the Lord through a study of his word. We also want to remember the admonitions of Leviticus chapter 19, to be holy for the Lord our God is holy. And we want to remember the story of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and the prophet that came to Jeroboam. Rehoboam lost the northern kingdom as part of a judgment against Solomon, but in the process, he had taken advice from young, inexperienced advisors rather than listening to the advice of older, experienced advisors. This resulted in the loss of the northern kingdom, and when those northern tribes separated from Judah, they were led by Jeroboam. This had been prophesied by God, and God had advised Jeroboam while Solomon was still alive, that he should lead in a certain way. Jeroboam left Israel and lived in Egypt until Solomon passed, and then he came back and took control of the northern tribes. Instead of following the advice that God had given him, he decided to raise up high places in the mountains and tell the people that they should worship God there rather than go into Jerusalem to worship as would have been appropriate. He also set up golden calves at those locations and told the people that these were the gods that led them out of Egypt. And he set up a false priesthood to support the worship at these locations. This didn't end after the reign of Jeroboam, but continued until the time of Christ. And it was an abomination before the Lord, every king of Israel that allowed these high places to stay was considered an evil king by God as recorded in the histories. We see this time and again, no king of Israel from the time of Jeroboam on was considered good because they left those high places up. Now God just didn't let Jeroboam do this terrible thing. He sent a prophet and that prophet came to Jeroboam and told him that he was doing wrong. Jeroboam ignored him and that prophet went on his way home. Now he was met on the way by another prophet from Israel who wanted the honor of his company. So he made up a story and told this prophet from Judah that he should come and have a meal with him this was an absolute lie, but the first prophet believed the lie and went and had that meal. And no sooner had he sat down to eat that meal than the second prophet did prophesy and told the first prophet that he would be killed because he believed this lie. And indeed, as he got up to leave, he was met in the way by a lion and killed. It's a terrible story, one that runs counter to our expectations. Our sense of justice would have said that the second prophet, being a liar, should have been the one that was punished, but God punished the one that believed the lie. And I feel this reflects the way that God felt about Israel believing the lies of 
Jeroboam and following his instruction to worship God in those high places. Once they had done that, they created a false god, a god something other than the god that led them out of Egypt, the god of their fathers. They created this false god and worshipped him instead of Jehovah. It's a terrible thing that they did, and it's something that we're susceptible to as well. Any time we make convenience and following the instruction of man more important than doing what we know God has said to do in his, wor in his word, we're doing the same thing. We're, we're letting ourselves be led away by a lie, and God does not find pleasure in that. And he showed his offense. I sing because I'm happy. I sing. Our sense of justice would have said that the second prophet, being a liar, should have been the one that was a man. I hope that you will find that the things that I present to you out of God's word are true to his word. If you find something contradicting his word in the things that I say, I hope that you'll bring that to me. Because it is not my intent to deceive you. It's not my intent to accidentally mislead you either. So please, bring that to me if you find something, and we can study together and find the truth of the matter. I hope you'll join me now as we enter into this study of 2 Samuel chapter 17, that you will find something rewarding there. A word on names. There are many names that we're going to encounter throughout the readings that we go through. I hope that you will forgive me mispronunciations. I try to be consistent in the way that I pronounce names so that there is at least some way to recognize when I'm talking about the same person. But of course, I'm not going to do that perfectly. So please bear with me in that and forgive me any mispronunciations. We'll do the best we can. Chapter 17 from the English Standard Version. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic and all the people who are with him will flee. I will strike down only the king and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Verse five. Then Absalom said, call Hoshea the archite also and let us hear what he has to say. And when Hoshea came to Absalom, Absalom said to him, Thus has Ahithophel spoken. Shall we do as he says? If not, you speak. Then Hoshea said to Absalom, This time the counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good. Hoshea said, You know that your father and his men are mighty men, and that they are enraged, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Besides, your father is expert in war. He will not spend the night with the people. Behold, even now he has hidden himself in one of the pits or in some other place. And as soon as some of the people fall at the first attack, whoever hears it will say, There has been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Verse 10. Then even the valiant man, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will utterly melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and that those who are with him are valiant men. But my counsel is that all Israel be gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba as the sand of the sea for multitude and that you go to battle in person. Verse 12. So we shall come upon him in some place where he is to be found and we shall light upon him as the dew falls on the ground and of him and all the men with him not one will be left. If he withdraws into a city then all Israel will bring ropes to that city and we shall drag it into the valley until not even a pebble is to be found there. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hashai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel, so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom. Verse 15. Then Hashai said to Zadok and Abiathar the priest, Thus and so did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so have I counseled. Now therefore, send quickly and tell David, Do not stay tonight at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means pass over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Verse 17, Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz were waiting at Enrogel. A female servant was to go and tell them, and they were to go and tell King David, for they were not to be seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So both of them went away quickly and came to the house of a man 
at Bahurim, who had a well in his courtyard, and they went down into it. Verse 19, And the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and scattered grain on it, and nothing was known of it. When Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said to them, They have gone over the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Verse 21, After they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went and told King David, they said to David, Arise and go quickly over the water, for thus and so has Ahithophel counseled against you. Then David arose and all the people who were with him, and they crossed the Jordan. By daybreak not one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. Verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself, and he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. Verse 24, Then David came to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Now Absalom had set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra the Ishmaelite, who had married Abigail the daughter of Nahash, sister of Azariah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. Verse 27, When David came to Mahanaim, Shobi the son of Nahash, from Maba of the Ammonites, and Machir the son of the Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barzillai the Gileadite from Rogalim, brought beds, basins, and earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese from the herd, for David and the people with him to eat, for they said, The people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Okay, so last time we read out of chapter 16, where David had already left Jerusalem, and he was crossing the summit of the Mount of Olives, presumably, after the events of chapter 15. And they encounter Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, and he had with him a couple of donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, it says in verse 1 of chapter 16 a hundred bunches of raisins, a hundred of summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, Why have you brought these things? And Ziba said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat, the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. The king said, Where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem, for he said, Today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father, in verse 3. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord the king. So this story about Mephibosheth's servant, Ziba, meeting David in the way with these material goods is an interesting story. And it's one that is troubling later when we find uh, David encountering Mephibosheth himself and getting a contradictory story. So here we have Ziba saying that he brought these things to serve David and advising the king that Mephibosheth had stayed behind because he sought to be restored as king of Israel, which, uh, when you think about it, was kind of an absurd expectation. But nevertheless, it's plausible here, and David rewards Ziba with granting him all the material goods that belonged to the household of Mephibosheth. Then we see this almost comical story of Shemaiah meeting King David near Bahurim. He was of the family of the house of Saul, it says in verse 5. And he came out and cursed all those people with David continually. And he threw stones at David and all the servants and as he cursed, he said, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, Joab's brother, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king says this in response, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, 
Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road, and Shemaiah went along on the hillside opposite and cursed as they went, throwing stones at him and flung dust. So it would have been an absolutely funny thing to watch had it not been such a serious situation. And then it says the day that the king and the people with him arrived weary at the Jordan, and there he refreshed himself. Then it switches back to Absalom in verse 15. Absalom and all the people of the men of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. When Hosea the archite, David's friend, came, came to Absalom, Hosea said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king. And Absalom said, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And he says back to Absalom, No, for whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. And again, whom should I serve? Should it not be his son? As I have served your father, so I will serve you. Then Absalom seemed to accept that, and he says to Ithophel, Give your counsel, what shall we do? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go in to your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went in to his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God, so was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. So this is in accordance with the judgment that was prescribed against David in chapter 12, as we read last week uh, in reference. And we have this terrible, terrible thing that Ahithophel counseled Absalom to do. And one might say, did, did, did God tell Absalom uh, to do this through Ahithophel and certainly that's not the case God does not tempt nor cause to be tempted man but man is tempted once his own desires swell up in him to do those things uh, and sin against God this is not what God directs the hearts of men to do but God did bring a judgment on David and told David that this would happen as a judgment against him because of what he'd done so these things were allowed to proceed unabated and this terrible thing happened in the sight of all Israel because this was a judgment on David and the sin that he committed. Now, last week I said that I, I don't understand why Ahithophel would have felt this way and I look, honestly, I still don't. But I did read up a little bit and found that there is reference that Ahithophel was in fact Bathsheba's grandfather and I have gone back and looked, but I don't see the connection. Its reference is in chapter 11, verse 3, I believe, where it says that Bathsheba was the daughter of a particular person. But it doesn't say there that Ahithophel was her grandfather. Perhaps it says somewhere else that there's a connection between Ahithophel and the person mentioned there. So I can neither confirm or deny that that's the case. If it is the case, I still don't understand why Ahithophel would have responded in this way against this now relative of his. If this was the case, then Bathsheba now being married to David for so many years would have been a relationship that would have been strengthened, I would have thought. But the concept by the ones who make the comments was that this was a dishonorable circumstance even at this point and that Ahithophel resented what David had done and bringing this shame upon Bathsheba. It makes a little bit of sense, I guess, but I still don't quite understand how the connections are being made, the determination that Ahithophel was, in fact, her grandfather. I still don't see that, but I just wanted to let you know that that did come up in my readings, so there you go. And I also wanna make sure that it's clear that I'm not saying that Ahithophel did these things at the instruction of the Lord. And I'm not sure that a, a prophecy given that sounds bad, that tells the bad story, though it may be inspired by the Lord, is 
causal that you can say that God caused something evil to have happened because of the statements that we know from the New Testament about temptation and the way men sin. God has nothing to do with that. That is man bringing that upon himself. And in every case that we read, that I've encountered anyway, that certainly seems to be the case from the very beginning, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, all the way down through the stories of the Bible. It is the desire that is in the heart of man that causes the temptation to arise and him yielding to that that is in fact sin. Going on into today's reading, Ahithophel continues saying to Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men and I will arise and pursue David tonight. Now I'm led to believe that what we're about to read that was Ahithophel's plan was a good plan, but it seems crazy to me. But his plan was that they would pursue, come upon him while he is weary and discouraged, which that does make sense, throw him into a panic and all the people who are with him will flee presuming that all those people would leave him defenseless and I will strike down only the king and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. So that seems a little naive to me, but again, presumably this was a better plan than the one that Ashea advises Absalom to follow. You seek the life of only one man and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel, it says in verse 4. Then Absalom calls Hoshea the archite and says, What do you say? And Hoshea says, This time the counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good. Hoshea says, You know that your father and his men are mighty and that they are enraged like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Besides, your father is expert in war. He will not spend the night with the people. So she, he's making this assumption, and I don't think it's true. I think we find the opposite to be exactly true. Behold, even now he has hidden himself in one of the pits or in some other place. As soon as some of the people fall at the first attack, whoever hears it will say, There has been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Now I'm presuming that this means that no matter who dies in this first altercation, the people will assume that it's Absalom who's lost. But it continues now, then even the valiant man whose heart is like the heart of a lion will utterly melt with fear, for all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man and that those who are with him are valiant men. But my counsel is that all Israel be gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba as the sand by the sea for multitude and that you go to battle in person. So, so we shall come upon him in some place where he is to be found, and we shall light upon him as dew falls on the ground, and of him and all the men with him not one will be left. If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we shall drag it into the valley until not even a pebble is to be found there. So what he's talking about is the complete annihilation of not only David, but all those mighty men that were with him. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hesheia the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel, for the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel, so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom. So here this verse, I think, is telling that Ahithophel's plan was, in fact, the better plan, and that Hesheia's plan was an absurdity that would bring harm against uh, Absalom. And that was what the Lord wanted, so he clouded people's judgment. In verse 15, it continues, Hesheia said to Zadok and Abiathar, remember that they had come back to Jerusalem so that they could spy out and help Hosea bring information from the, from the uh, council of Absalom to David. And that's what he was doing here. He comes to Zadok and Abiathar, thus and so did Ahithophel counsel Absalom, and I am amazed that they abbreviated the plan to thus and so did. That's an amazing thing. So many places we see everything completely repeated, but in here, in this location, we find them abbreviating and not recounting the whole story. And I'm amazed and amused by that. And the elders of Israel, and thus and so have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, do not stay tonight at the forge of the wilderness, but by all means, 
pass over lest the king and all the people who were with him be swallowed up. So certainly Hashai understood that David was in fact with the people at the ford and not hidden away as he kind of indicated to uh, Absalom. Now Jonathan and Ahimeaz were waiting at Enrogel and a female servant was to go and tell them so that they would not be caught coming and going. Uh, but that plan didn't work. A man still saw them taking this information from the servant, apparently. And that man told Absalom. So some other men went out, went after Jonathan and Ahimeaz. They came to a man at Bahurim who had a well in his courtyard, and they hid down inside of it. And the woman there took and spread a covering over the well's mouth, scattering grain over it to make it look like it was in use. And nothing was known of this. So when Absalom's servants came to inquire, she said that they had gone over the brook of water. And they looked around, and I would assume they looked both there in the presence of the woman, and they crossed over the brook to see if they could find the trail, and they found nothing. They returned to Jerusalem. In verse 21, it continues, After they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went and told King David what they knew. They said to David, Arise and go quickly over the water, for thus and so has Ahithophel counseled against you. Again with the abbreviation. Then David arose and all the people who were with him, and they crossed the Jordan by daybreak. Not a one was left on the other side of Jordan. Then it says in verse 23, Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed. He saddled his donkey and went off to his home city. There he set his house in order and hanged himself. So he committed suicide because he saw that his instruction had not been followed. And I guess knowing that his instruction was the one that would have worked, he felt like this would have been the end of Absalom's insurrection. So now he commits suicide and was buried in the tomb of his father. Then David came to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. And Absalom had set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Now Amasa was apparently related by marriage to Joab and Abishiah. So uh, maybe Joab was still in Jerusalem and had not gone with David. Uh, but in, anyway, Amasa was now over the army instead of Joab. He was the son of a man named Ithra, who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, the sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. So when we find that Joab and Abishai are the sons of Zeruiah, that's the mother, not the father. And Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanaim, Shobi, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah, of the Ammonites, and Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barz and Barzillai, and Barzillai the Gileadite from Rogalim, and by all means, I don't think any of those are pronounced correctly, brought beds, basins, and earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So this, this great kindness was shown to David from these men who were loyal to him. It's a terrible story again of this great insurrection, this great rebellion against David by Absalom, his own son. And of course, this was part of the judgment upon David for his sin with Bathsheba. But it doesn't make it any better. It, it's still hard to read, hard to see these things. It's encouraging to see that not everyone stood against David that many stayed true to him and served him even as they stayed in the presence of Absalom. They still sought to serve David. What a wonderful indication of the great kind of man David was most of the time. Terrible story about Ahithophel and how he gave up. Uh, I don't understand that necessarily. Ahithophel's story is one worthy of great consideration we are to be men like Ahithophel, men at, who speak after the oracles of God. When we speak, we should be speaking as the oracles of God. That's a serious charge for Christians. Ahithophel, you know, by every indication before this rebellion, was one who did exactly that. When he spoke, 
it was with the wisdom of God and so much so that people felt like they were speaking to God through Ahithophel. To see him end his life in this, because of this situation rather than bear with it and, and, and deal with the outcome according to what faith would present itself uh, is troubling to me. I think that we should always trust in the Lord even when we find ourselves in, the, in a terrible place. We should trust in the Lord to deliver us. It is far better to trust in the Lord and depend on His grace and mercy than to seek our own salvation through our own works and devices. We will not find it there. We will only find it in the Lord. So I hope you found a word of encouragement in today's lesson. There's so much sadness here, and it will continue. So bear with me as we go on further with this story of Absalom's insurrection next time, Lord willing. We will be meeting today at 10 a.m., so please join us if you can. Hope to see you there. If you're sick in any way, please don't come to the auditorium, but instead stay home and enjoy the streaming service. God bless. Have a great week.